My name is Jennifer, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. Many thanks to the Nevada Historical Society for pre presenting this virtual event. We appreciate their commitment to supporting our community with educational events like these. To learn more about the Nevada Historical Society, visit their website at nvhistoricalsociety.org. And now I would like to introduce Sherry Hayes Zorn, Curator of History at the Nevada Historical Society. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so nice to have everybody here today and we really appreciate everybody signing up to listen to Guy Clifton's great talk today. Um, but I wanna introduce our host who has been a longtime supporter for the Nevada Historic Society, Neil Cobb, who we call lovingly our honorary <laughs> curator, who's done wonderful programming and outreach through the community all these years to promote amazing history for Reno and also promoting the Nevada Historic Society. So we really appreciate Neil's support through these years. So this has been a fun series and being able to get these wonderful speakers out to you guys on Zoom, it's really made a difference and, and we appreciate our wonderful speakers as well to, to work with us. So without further ado, let me introduce Neil Cobb. Hey, Neil. Sherry, thanks a million for a great introduction. I'll try and live up to it. <laughs> Today's speaker, Guy Clifton, is an award-winning journalist, author, and Nevada history historian raised in central Nevada town of Gabs and attended Gabs schools before attending the University of Nevada and the Reynolds School of Journalism. He started as a professional, his professional career as a sports editor at North Lake Tahoe Bonanza in 1986, before serving as the editor of the Record Courier in Gardnerville. His 30 year plus newspaper career is perhaps best known for his 22 years he spent at the Reno Evening Gazette, well, pardon me, the Reno Gazette Journal. He says, and he had written many, many wonderful Nevada articles and he had brought in different authors, Nevada authors, and let their stories be told and promote the books. Clifton is the author of eight books himself, all with Nevada themes, including the popular, You Know You're a Nevadan If series. Was, and in 1922, pardon me, 2022, he was honored as a distinguished Nevadan by the University of Nevada system for his contributions to the Silver State. So please at this time, welcome one of the best Nevadans you're ever gonna meet, Mr. Guy Clifton. Wow, Neil, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that one up, but uh, um, I have to make one little correction first. I never call myself a historian. Oh, no. you say I'm a history buff because the academics get mad at you if you call yourself a historian. So I'm a history buff. <laughs> but, but we'll get started here. And uh, um, welcome to this presentation of Jack Dempsey in Nevada. Um, before we jump into his involvement in Nevada, I thought it was important to let people know just who Jack Dempsey was. He was the heavyweight boxing champion of the world from 1919 to 1926, an era known as the golden age of sports. Uh, other figures that time, Babe Ruth from baseball, Red Grange from football, Bobby Jones in golf, Bill Tilden in tennis. They were some of the giants of the era as well. Dempsey fought in the first million dollar gate against George Car Carpentier, and he fought in boxing's first $2 million gate in a fight known as the long count fight against Gene Tunney held in uh, Chicago at Soldier Field in 1927. Dempsey lost this fight, but he kind of gained uh, America's love because they thought that he got robbed in the fight. Um, he 
he knocked Tunney down, as you can see here in this photo. And uh, um, Tunney was on the canvas for, they think, 15 to 18 seconds. Dempsey didn't go to a neutral corner with a rule that had just been implemented that year, right before that fight. And the referee didn't pick up the count at the right time. And everybody thought Jim Dempsey got cheated, but he did not himself. He said, if that happened for Gene, that's the breaks. And it made him a hero in the eyes of the people. Now, I would argue that in, in his heyday, Jack Dempsey was probably the biggest star of the day. And when people look back at the 1920s now, they'll say, naturally, Babe Ruth was. But as you can see from this popularity contest done in 1928, of a million, over a million people that were surveyed responded to this, Jack Dempsey was the most popular by far with twice as many votes as Babe Ruth. Tunney was third, then Lou Gehrig from the Yankees, Bobby Jones, and some of the others down the list. And consider this, Babe Ruth's highest salary, highest annual salary with the New York Yankees was $85,000 a year. Jack Dempsey made $717,000 for one fight against Gene Tunney in 1926. Um, he was rich, he was famous, and he was none of those things the first time he set foot in Nevada. Um, he didn't come to Reno by accident. A guy named Jack Thurm, was uh, starting a thing called the Jockey Athletic Club and building a, an arena um, at Third and Plaza Streets to hold boxing matches. And he signed Dempsey to fight on an undercard of a belt or a card that he was having. And uh, there were there were four fights, and all the fighters they were training at the Depot Saloon on Commercial Row, and all the fighters they thought were going to win were training in the evenings and all the fighters they thought were going to lose were training in the morning and they had Dempsey training in the morning. He was matched up against a fighter named Animus Campbell and uh, ended up knocking him out. And uh, Dempsey always says he was much better fighter in the ring than he ever was practicing or in training. And he certainly proved that out on this day. In fact, he said he did such a good job that nobody else in Reno wanted to fight him. And so he hung around for about a month, was training down at Moana Springs, and but couldn't get a fight. So he finally got an offer to go down and fight in Goldfield. So at the Hippodrome Theater in Goldfield, he's matched up against a fighter named Johnny Sudenberg, whose nickname was the Big Swede. And uh, um, they ended up fighting 10 rounds and I, sh I should back up just for a minute and say that Dempsey was, was not rich or famous at the time that he first started coming to Reno. He's 19 years old and he was flat broke. He couldn't afford to take the train from Salt Lake where he lived to Reno. So he traveled there by holding on to the brake beams underneath the train, um, a practice called riding the rods that the hobos did. Um, so, but he made his way to Goldfield and uh, uh, couldn't afford a, a room at the Goldfield Hotel or any anything like that. So he got a space in a um, one of the dugout caves where the miners stayed. And uh, but he and Johnny Sudenberg at the Hippodrome Arena fight ten rounds bloody as can be, and uh, um, he gets paid $100 for it. But near the end of that fight, um, he got not kind of silly. Uh, the fight was declared a draw, and he said, luckily, somebody stuffed him in a wheelbarrow and wheeled him back to his cave so, so that he could uh, sleep it off. But he got up the, the next morning and went to find his manager, a guy named Jack Gilfeather, only to find out that Gil Feather had gotten drunk and gambled away all Dempsey's $100 winnings. 
So he was out of luck there, but luckily some guys from the Tonopah Athletic Club um, were at the fight in Goldfield. They thought Dempsey got a raw deal. So they set up a rematch for a few weeks later up in Tonopah. And uh, once again, it was 10 more brutal rounds of, of boxing. The record, record books say Dempsey was the winner, but Dempsey said that uh, it's the one time in his boxing career that he felt like quitting. He was, he was hurting so bad. Um, they both got paid $100 for the fight. And after they cleaned up and uh, um, got dressed and everything, they went to the Cobweb Saloon to have a couple of uh, beers to celebrate. And the place got robbed. And the old, the, he wrote this in his autobiography. He said, um, they got, there were two gunmen that, that robbed the place and, and took their money. So they were broke again. When I first read this in his autobiography, I thought, you know, this is just a tall tale. There's no way that that could have been true. Um, you know, Dempsey had, had a chance or, um, wasn't always truthful with, with the media and stuff. And, uh, um, I just thought it was a story, but then I looked through the papers of the day and sure enough, there was a uh, two holdup men make a good haul, rob 16 people in the cobweb bar. So, so, so far he and Sudenberg have fought 20 rounds and, uh, have no money to show for it. They are sick of Tonopah and Goldfield and they jump on a hand car and pump it North toward, they're going to eventually head back toward Reno. They stop at a place that he called in his autobiography, Miner's Junction. And I'm not sure if that was Mina or if it may have been Coldale Junction, but somewhere along the lane, along the way, they go into a saloon and um, offer the crowd in there, say, you know, introduce themselves as prize fighters, say, we'll put on an exhibition for you guys if you pass the hat. And so they fight another 10 rounds, um, knocking the, the heck out of each other. And uh, they passed the hat and they raised a grand total of $3.60. So as you can imagine, Dempsey was thinking about quitting at this time. Um, he went to, to Reno and uh, he and Sodenberg were supposed to fight and the, the fight got canceled at the last minute. Uh, he was gonna head home to Salt Lake, but they had one more fight left in them. And it was uh, several months later in Ely. And uh, this time, uh, Dempsey made a quick knockout of, of Sudenberg and the Ely papers complained about it and said that it looked like Sudenberg had in, had a few too many beers or a little bit too much of the grape juice. And, uh, but anyway, Dempsey survived that. Um, along the way, he also ended up getting married. And one other thing happened to him at this time um, that he took on a new manager by the name of uh, Jack Kearns. And Jack Kearns was a pretty well-known manager who liked the fancy clothes and fancy things. And he wanted Dempsey to, to emulate him, which he did. And uh, it, it all helped in kind of the ballyhoo of promoting Dempsey um, in the heavyweight ranks and getting him noticed. And eventually it led to him becoming the number one contender for the heavyweight, for the heavyweight crown. Um, he fought in Reno against a guy named uh, Jack Moran at uh, Moana Hot Springs in 1918 and, uh, and knocked him out pretty fast. And uh, right, up, right after that, he ended up getting a, a chance at the heavyweight title. It also introduced him for the first time to Tex Rickard. And uh, Tex Rickard was a former Goldfield and Rawhide and Ely resident. Um, who promoted the Gans Nelson fight, heavy or lightweight championship fight that was in 1906 in Goldfield. And he promoted the 1910 fight, the fight of the century between Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries, the Great White Hope fight in Reno in 1910. So he was probably the most famous boxing promoter of the day, who um, at this time was uh, in New York and running Madison Square Garden. But Tex Rickard didn't want to make this fight between Jess Willard, the champion, and Jack Dempsey, 
Willard was six foot six, weighed about 245, and Dempsey was about six one and weighed about 185 pounds at the time. And uh, so Tex Rickard was afraid that that Willard might kill Dempsey in the ring and ruin his future plans for boxing. But he went ahead and made the fight. And like Dempsey said, he was not a, not a good practice fighter, but he was a tiger in the ring. And he knocked Willard down six times in the first round, broke his ribs, knocked out five of his teeth. And uh, um, Willard was down in the corner at the at the end of the first round and saved by the bell but he made it through the second round and the third but he didn't answer the bell for the fourth round so all of a sudden jack dempsey is the heavyweight champion of the world but it looked like life was going to be easy he signed a ton of uh, lucrative contracts with with hollywood and with vaudeville making a thousand dollars a week from vaudeville um, making thousand dollars of, of movies for um, with Hollywood and stuff, but before he could get started in all that, his ex-wife, now ex-wife, because her name is Maxine Cates, and when they got married a couple years before that, she was fifteen years older than her than than Dempsey, and she was. Uh, a piano player recognizes a piano player that's in quotes um, at a brothel in Salt Lake at the time when they got married. She is since working at a brothel in Wells as a piano player. And uh, she writes a letter to the American Legion or to the San Francisco Chronicle that accused Dempsey of being a draft dodger. She was mad because Dempsey was the heavyweight champion and making all this money. And now she was divorced and not getting any of it. So she was she was steamed. So she wrote this letter to the Chronicle accusing Dempsey of being a draft dodger from, from or a slacker, they called her, from World War I. And um, she, uh, she wrote this letter and the American Legion in uh, San Francisco picked it up and they ended up putting Dempsey on trial for this. And I just really like this photo because of this fox stole that she's wearing. And uh, it's like even has the fox leg and stuff like, like that on there. I've never seen anything like that before. But, uh, and this is Jack Dempsey's sister that, that she's in that photo with. But so they put Dempsey on trial. So he has to get through this before anything else can happen. And to do that, they ended up hiring, Tex Rickard did, paid for it. Um, this lawyer to the stars, his name was Gavin McNabb, um, probably the most famous Hollywood lawyer at the time. He was uh, represented Mary Pickford and uh, um, quite a few uh, uh, Fatty Arbuckle and uh, some of the other Hollywood stars of the day. And so they get him to 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 represent him. He actually had to give up a case where he was scheduled to be in Nevada representing Mary Pickford in her divorce, um, a case involving her divorce from uh, Owen Moore. Um, and he had to give that up so he could go represent Dempsey. He gave that up to a guy named Patrick McCarran, who built uh, quite a reputation from, from that case and ended up being our United States Senator and, and the namesake of... Uh, at least a road in Reno, formerly a airport in Las Vegas. But they get uh, the the trial gets underway in 1920. Uh, McNabb gets uh, Maxine on the on the stand and basically exposes her um, as a fraud, just out to get some money. The jury was out for exactly seven minutes and came back and uh, and freed Dempsey up to. Uh, uh, be, said he was not guilty and he finally could get on about his life. So he moved to LA and was started making movies and he was really a matinee star um, down there fitting in with, with the whole crowd. Um, here he is with uh, Clara Bow, who was the it girl in the twenties and uh, 
she became the wife of uh, Rex Bell, who would become the Nevada Lieutenant Governor for for a long time, and uh, um, had a Western store in in Reno too. So, uh, um, so he he made a lot of movies. Can finally start um, in, enjoying his time. Um, he got married for a second time to Estelle Taylor, who was a an actress and not very good actress, but uh, um, she liked everything about being married to the heavyweight champion, including the the riches and the fame that came with it. She liked everything except boxing. <laughs> so she hated boxing. And in particular, she hated Jack Kearns, who was uh, um, Dempsey's manager. So Dempsey ended up losing the title to, to uh, in 1926 to, to Gene Tunney and then lost the rematch in 1927. But it looked like he was going to be in good shape um, financially. He was going to retire. And Tex Rickard had offered him the opportunity for the two of them to uh, um, become partners. And he could help Tex in his promoting. But in 1929, two bad things happened. Um, Tex Rickard died of acute appendicitis or from complications from appendicitis surgery. And later that fall was the Wall Street crash. And Dempsey had many of his millions, he was worth about $5 million at the time. His millions were all involved in the, in, in the stock market. And he told people that I was just like everyone else, I was broke. He lost his fortune. So he had to set up out trying to regain that. At the same time, he, since he was no longer rich, um, Estelle was no longer enamored with him and her hatred of boxing um, shone through and their marriage was really struggling at the same time. Now in 1931, Nevada was changing a couple of its laws, legalizing gambling and liberalizing the divorce laws from six months down to six weeks. And Dempsey actually came and testified to the Nevada legislature in 1931, saying that he uh, um, was thinking about opening a, a gaming property with partners and, uh, and wanted to support that. So in April of 1931, Dempsey comes, comes back to Reno. And as you can see, the headline on the Nevada State Journal, Dempsey due today for six weeks rest. But he came in, checked in the Riverside Motel, and despite that headline, he told the press that, no, no, Estelle and I are just fine. Um, we had a little row, but we've made up, and uh, every, everything is fine between us. Um, the next day, he filed for divorce. Um, <laughs> this, he is on KOH Radio. Um, Earl Leaf is the name of the reporter that, that is interviewing him on KOH. So. But so he filed, decided that he was going to file for divorce the next day. So I'm trying to find my place in my script here. I got way ahead of myself. So he rented a room on, or rented a house on California Avenue to spend his six weeks rest. Um, this was the Stein Miller um, Parsons home. Um, I can't remember the the uh, address specifically, but it's one of the mansions up on the bluff above the river. And uh, um, he rented that for $1,000 a month in uh, 1931. So that's a pretty penny. Now, having Jack Dempsey move to your, move to your town in uh, 1931 would be kind of equivalent today that if we had, um, you know, say a Tiger Woods or LeBron James or even a Tom Cruise moved to Reno today, um, everything he did was of interest to the to the press and the papers from around the country sent correspondence. Uh, um, the LA paper sent uh, Luella Parsons, their gossip columnist, who came up and said, "Everywhere Dempsey goes, he's followed by divorcees and." Uh, uh, and little kids who want his autograph and, uh, um, and people that want to talk to him. So he's, that he doesn't look left or right, he just goes home. But whether he was uh, 
mowing the lawn in front of his house or uh, fishing on the Truckee River, greeting the circus when it came to town over on Valley Road. Um, he was, you know, in demand and everybody wanted to see exactly what he was doing. Now, his closest associates in Reno, oh, this is, um, and even having lunch with kids. And uh, I, I love this photo because uh, uh, when I got it, I asked a lot of the old timers while I was working on this that I, that I knew in town if they could recognize anybody in here. And not a single person could recognize any of these kids. And I could not figure that out, why, why they wouldn't recognize it until I was going through some of the old papers um, of, and eventually saw this story. It says Dempsey's the most popular man in Reno for youthful visitors from Lassen. And it turned out this was just a bunch of uh, um, crossing guard trainees from Susanville and all they wanted to do when they came to Reno was to meet Jack Dempsey. So, so Dempsey's main associates when he was in Reno were two guys who are pretty well known if you know a little bit about Reno history. Bill Graham on the left and James McKay on the right. Um, they were charitably called sportsmen by the, the Reno newspapers. Um, Guy Rochar, former uh, state archivist, best described them, I think, as the overlords of the underworld in Reno. They uh, um, ran the bank club casino and they ran uh, um, the brothels that were on Second Street, the cribs that um, where Ace's ballpark is now. And uh, they ended up going to, to prison eventually for uh, uh, a few years later for uh, um, wire fraud for a horse racing scheme that they had they had going and uh, and uh, they uh, were also chief suspects in the disappearance of uh, um, Roy Frisch, probably Reno's most famous missing person case. But uh, I'll point out just for here real quick is the 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 chain on uh, on. Uh, Bill Graham's vest here. So we'll come back and talk, talk about that near the end of this, this program. So they come up with an idea that since Dempsey's here and uh, that he needs to do something during his, his six weeks rest, that they're gonna promote a fight, um, build a big arena and, uh, yeah, and host a prize fight. So, um, this is Mayor E. e. Roberts of Reno, and uh, he was all for it. Uh, um, so they scheduled this prize fight for the 4th of July um, in 1931. The town bought into it. You can see there's a, a, a banner boxing. The tickets are on sale. This fight headquarters, I don't know exactly what building that is. Neil might know. Um, better better than I would, but uh, um, a lot of uh, excitement going on. This was the biggest fight in Reno since 1910, Johnson Jeffries. So they need to pick the two fighters that they want to have. And one of them was fairly easy. They picked uh, Max Bear, the up and coming California heavyweight, um, known as a good puncher. He'd actually killed a guy in the ring um, a couple years be before this. And um, He's, uh, if that name is familiar, he's Max Bear Jr.'s father, obviously, and uh, um, Max Bear Jr. played Jethro on Beverly Hillbillies. So they selected him, and then they, I don't know who came up with the idea for the, for the other opponent, but it was a really good one, being the time and place that it was, it was held. Uh, Pauline Oiskaden, who was a, uh, a Basque heavyweight from Spain, and uh, whose involvement attracted a lot of uh, um, people from as Idaho in the West, um, Idaho, Utah, and obviously Nevada with a strong Basque population as well uh, to, to want to attend this fight. So they set up training camps. Um, Max Bear was at Lawton's Hot Springs, 
Muscadin was at Steamboat Springs. And some of the biggest excitement was that uh, um, Dempsey ordered a training suit for himself, which got, got the media all a buzz that, that he was gonna work out during the, while these guys were in their training camps as well. So they signed, uh, they signed the contract to, to hold the fight. This is Governor Balzar in the middle between Max and, uh, and Paulino and there's Dempsey, of course, and um, all, all their managers and, and whatnot. So um, the fight's all set for the 4th of July. So Dempsey was a regular figure at, the, at both training camps and stuff like that. Here he is in his training suit and with Paulino and Tom Sharkey, who was a, a real popular boxer in the, in the early 1900s as well. Um, I love this photo because Bull Montana um, is this, this guy's name on the, on the far right. And Bull Montana um, was a professional wrestler and he was also um, um, in a lot of Hollywood movies, uh, specifically um, Bella Lugosi movies as a monster and stuff like that. And I just love this photo because he has the, like the worst cauliflower ear I've ever seen on anybody. So, but anyway, um, by far Dempsey was the, the star attraction above both of the, of the fighters for, for the media interest and everything like that. And everybody who went to one of these training camps, if he was there, wanted to meet him. Uh, I include this photo because uh, um, one of my great frustrations when I was working on this project um, a few years ago was that I could never find out who these little boys were um, that, that wanted their picture taken with Jack Dempsey. And uh, um, I just throw it out there because I know there's a lot of history buffs that are looking at this. And if you know who these little boys are, I'd still like to know that because that has driven me crazy for um, several years. So they hired um, Reno architect Frederick DeLongchamps to design a stadium um, at the racetrack out on uh, Wells Avenue. It was called Alameda Avenue at the time. Um, so DeLongchamps uh, um, designed the stadium and this clubhouse, which they called Jack Dempsey's Casino. Um, they had horse racing and fights and everything. And the, um, it's, the arena was to seat 20,000 people. The lumber was provided by the uh, um, Clover Valley Lumber Company and was made out of fresh cut pine. So the 4th of July, the fights held at noon. Um, it's over 100 degrees, blazing hot. Uh, Dempsey served as a referee. Here's Governor Balzar, Morley Griswold. There were a big uh, Hollywood contingent came to watch, including Edward G. Robinson, Tom Mix, and some of the other stars of the day. Um, but oh, and and Ty Cobb, the baseball player, was there as well. So one of the funniest stories from this fight: the fight was pretty pretty boring itself. It went uh, um, twenty rounds. After 19 rounds, it had been basically even, and Dempsey said, whoever wins the 20th round is going to win the fight, and uh, Muscadin ended up winning it. Um, it attracted a, a very big crowd uh, that was amazing because uh, um, partway through the, the heat of the day, the sap from the fresh pine wood came through the, through the boards on the, on the patch and, uh, and uh, ruined more than one person's pair of pants. Now, Ty Cobb, the journalist who worked at the, um, the uh, Nevada State Journal and uh, Reno Gazette Journal for, for many, many years, was a little kid at the time and went to this fight with his uh, uncle and said that he got in trouble with his mom because he ruined a new pair of Levi's um from from getting pitch all over it in this fight so uh and the two tie cops were no are no relation so but, but whether it was uh, the excitement of this fight in front of a big crowd or what it was dempsey decided that he was going to launch a comeback uh, and try to regain the heavyweight championship for himself 
And he launched that at the Chestnut Street Arena, which is uh, Chestnut Street is now Arlington Avenue. And the arena was next to Tony's El Patio Ballroom, and, um, which I think is kind of the site of the where the Sundowner Casino was. And I think those are condos now. I don't know the, the name of them off the top of my head. Um, so Dempsey decides he's going to launch, launch a comeback. But before he can do that to, to get back on the road full time, um, he has to take care of his divorce from Estelle Taylor. Um, so that happened at, at the courthouse. This is uh, his attorney, Robert Burns. And um, that's uh, Jim McKay, who was his, his character witness at the time. And uh, uh, there was almost uh, a big legal uh, to do about about this divorce and stuff, but it, because of McKay's involvement in it, but it never, never came to fruition or hurt Dempsey or anything like that. But that's that's another story for another time. So he finally gets divorced, and it's one of the few times you will ever see his divorce papers here in Reno, where he signed his full given name, William Harrison Dempsey. His name was not Jack Dempsey. Um, he, it was just the name that he fought under. And uh, so that's one of the few times you'll ever see his full, his full name was on his divorce papers here in Reno. So whether the rest of the world thought Dempsey at 36 was serious uh, launching this comeback tour, the Reno papers certainly did. And they adopted him as our Jack Dempsey, um, had ads. He, he, he fought his first fight at the comeback um, here in Reno and then went on the road and fought several dozen times and was headlining a, um, a card where he fought three fighters in, uh, on the same night um, back in Reno for, for Labor Day. And that's what this ad was for. He went on the road and uh, when he, when he came, came back to Reno, he told the press, wow, it's good to be home. And uh, he ended up buying a home on Joaquin Miller Avenue that he's standing in front of here. And it's pretty recognizable by the bricks. It's on the, the, the corner. I can't remember the, the side street over there in the Newlands neighborhood, but uh, um, uh, still, still looks exactly the same, except one of the, one of the lights behind him there is, uh, was was broken the last time I was there. The lady, Mrs. Constantino, owned it for a long time, and I'm not sure who, who owns it now. I knocked on the door several times to see if they wanted a copy of this picture, and nobody ever answered. They probably thought I was trying to sell them vacuum cleaner or something like that. So, oh, but I should go back to that uh, that photo. Um, Dempsey fit back into the community in uh, this 1932, and uh, he actually uh, sponsored the uh, um, help help promote the Reno Rodeo, which was coming back after a ten year absence. Um, they had bankrupted themselves a, a decade earlier, and uh, and uh, were just coming back. So Dempsey uh, sponsored the saddle bronc riding title and presented this trophy to the to the winner of it as him on top, and then these these horses down here around it. It's called the Jack Dempsey Cup. And it was won, won by a rider um, from Canada named Pete Knight. And that trophy today is in the National Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City um, as part of their collection. And uh, um, they contacted me a few years ago for a copy of this photo, which I gladly sent them along. So also in 1932, Dempsey puts his promotion hat back on and uh, promoted the fight between Max Bear and Paulo, you know, who's, or not Paulo, you know, it was Max Bear and Kingfish Levinsky um, back at his arena. And uh, so in 1932 on the 4th of July, and here's Wallace Berry, who was a Hollywood star and Tom Mix over on, on the other side, um, Mayor Roberts, and here's Dempsey, of course. and. Uh, um, they promote this fight and uh, and and made a little bit of money from it and stuff like that. So all looked well and looked like Dempsey was gonna wanted to make Reno the the fight capital again. 
And, um, um, but two wives wasn't quite enough for, for Dempsey. He hadn't learned his lesson. And he met a divorcee by the name of Hannah Williams. And they were married. Uh, so he's married for the third time for Hannah, with Hannah. They, uh, she was a Broadway singer known as the Cheerful Little Earful. Um, they got married on their way back from, from New York. And uh, uh, had their honeymoon in, in Reno and, or they got married in Elko and uh, had their honeymoon at Lake Tahoe because they're in the state line club, Nick Abelman state line club at South shore and, uh, and then stayed around Reno for, for, for their honeymoon and stuff. But they soon moved to New York and that effectively ended Dempsey's time living in Reno. Um, but he would still come back quite often. And uh, one of those times was in during World War II in 1944. Um, he had joined the Coast Guard because he, when he was accused of being a slacker, he would get booed at, uh, and for World War I, he'd get booed at his boxing matches. He was often seen in the, um, you know, kind of the bad guy role at all these fights going against war heroes like Carpentier and uh, Gene Tunney was a fighting Marine. And uh, um, so Dempsey always, uh, um, always had that, that fear about him that, that people thought that he was a slacker. So when World War II came around, he wanted to enlist and they wouldn't let him enlist in the army and everything because he was too old. He was almost 50 at the time. And, uh, um, but he was able to join the Coast Guard and train and train recruits and go on and sell war bonds around. So he got that led him back to Reno in 1944 for a war bonds drive. Um, he raised about a half a million dollars in war bonds in just a few hours. And uh, they had a luncheon in his honor. He'd been living in, in New York for several years with, with Hannah. And uh, um, he got up at this luncheon and said how, he said, it's great to be back in Nevada. So he mispronounced the name. And I want to think that that's probably one of the only times that anybody ever got cheered for uh, mispronouncing Nevada was, was Jack Dempsey. Um, in 1950, he came back to Tonopah where they made him the honorary mayor. And uh, it was the 50th anniversary of Tonopah which was founded in 1900 by Jim Butler. and. Uh, but they made Dempsey the honorary mayor. Um, the Governor Vail Pittman and all um, this, our senators were there and, and just about everybody, but Dempsey was clearly the star of the show. The Tonopah paper put out a big extra um, edition said Dempsey coming and uh, um, it was an exciting time for them. One of the funniest things of this was that uh, um, Dempsey w traveled to the event with from Las Vegas with Hank Greenspun, the the uh, publisher of the Las Vegas Sun and Wilbur Clark, who uh, um, a former dealer at the bank club in Reno, who now owned the Desert Inn, uh, just started the Desert Inn in, uh, in Las Vegas. They went to the, the event together and uh, they, were, they were in the lobby of the Mizpah and this very excited woman comes running up to, uh, Hank Greenspun and said, oh, Mr. Dempsey, I'm so excited that you're here. And uh, meanwhile, Dempsey and, and Wilbur Clark were both cracking up and stuff, because you can see that, that Dempsey and, and, and Hank Greenspun favor each other a little bit. So um, Dempsey mentioned that in one of his autobiographies. And, uh, and he and Hank Greenspun were, were great friends for, for the remainder of, of their lives. And, uh, um, Dempsey actually testified um, on Greenspun's behalf when he got put on trial for transporting uh, weapons to Palestine when, when Israel was just starting. So Dempsey would return to Reno mostly um, unceremoniously and mostly just to visit his old friends. And one of his favorite haunts was the place called the East Side Inn, um, Dick and Ernie Evans owned on uh, on uh, East 4th Street. So here's him and Max Baer and um, that's Harold Smith and uh, um, 
but he would love to go to the East Side Inn. Um, Ernie Evans, or Dick Evans, I should say, was uh, from Youngstown, Ohio, and he was a boxer back in his day. So uh, the bar was kind of a tribute to, to, to old boxers and stuff like that. So this is Dick Evans uh, during his fighting days. And of course, Dempsey here. So they were, they were great friends. Um, let's see. Um, here, here's he and Dick. The, the, the place was notorious for um, people giving each other hot butts and uh, they had a phone that if you picked it up, it would squirt you in the face and all, all kinds of things like that. So they had a lot of fun at, at Dick and Ernie's. Um, in 1961, Dempsey came back to uh, Elko and was a keynote speaker when they were uh, doing a fundraiser for uh, um, the School for the Troubled Boys, the NYTC it's called now. This is a guy named Ernie Hall who given given Dempsey a uh, a new cowboy hat from uh, uh, I'm sure it was from uh, the saddle maker Garcia's or Capriola's um, there in Elko. So. In 1964 was kind of Dempsey's last publicized visit to to Reno. Um, it's said that he was, uh, um, he, Roland Belton, who's uh, right here, was, uh, worked at the Reno Evening Gazette and, uh, at the time and uh, caught wind that Dempsey was coming to town. So he arranged to, to interview him and they met at Pounding Park and um, Don Dondero, the great photographer, was, was there to shoot this picture. And uh, so Dempsey told Roland that uh, um, he was there on the advice of his doctors at the Mayo Clinic that he, he needed to, to get some rest and some good fresh air in, in Reno. Um, so he hung around town with his, his wife, Deanna. He had married for a fourth time. And uh, LBJ came to town during that time to, to uh, um, deliver a speech. Uh, President Johnson, um, here's... Uh, um, Alan Bible and uh, um, Howard Cannon, and that, that's uh, um, our governor, Grant Sawyer, in the background and stuff. But uh, um, LBJ and Jack Dempsey got to to reconnect at this at this event as well. So uh, that's at the State Building downtown. What Dempsey didn't tell Roland Melton is that um, his wife Deanna found out that her marriage before, before they got married um, was, a, was uh, still, still in effect because she had gotten a divorce in Tijuana that didn't count. So she had to come to Reno and spend six weeks um, to be able to obtain her divorce. And Dempsey already um, three times bitten um, was a nervous wreck and he couldn't stay in New York City waiting for her to spend six weeks in Reno. So he came out here and spent it with her. Dempsey lived until he was 88 years old or just a few days short of his 88th birthday. He died on May uh, 28, 1983. Uh, President Reagan eulogized him and said, Jack Dempsey was a champion that never lost his title in the eyes of the American people. And um, um, Jim Murray, the great sports writer for the uh, for the Los Angeles Times, said that more than a man died with Dempsey, he took an arrow with him. So he was referring to the golden age of sports. But if you look back today here in Nevada, there isn't too much to remind you that Dempsey was here. Um, this watch belongs to a guy named John Orich down in Goldfield, and it was given to to Dempsey, given, given to Bill Graham from Dempsey. And if you recall, I told you to look at uh, Bill Graham's pocket watch or his pocket watch chain back in that um, photo at the arena. So you could tell that he always used a pocket watch. And uh, I think that's probably where Dempsey got the idea. Um, there's this sign that's in Midas um, where Dempsey uh, trained when he was ma making his comeback. He did some training in Midas with the the kids there in Elko County, 
did a lot of hunting and uh, um, had fun playing with the kids in Midas. There's a, a photo at the museum uh, in Elko of him skipping rope with the with the, with some of the kids from from Midas. And there's this ring bell that does and uh, um, belonged to Dick Evans at Dick and Ernie's and uh, um, now hangs in Pinocchio's restaurant in in South Reno. Um, Dempsey had given that to to uh, to Dick Evans and his family still still has it and has it on loan at Pinocchio's and um, the program the history detectives in uh, in that was on PBS I um, wrote them and see if the, to see if they could authenticate it and we did a show and uh, um, could never prove yes or no that uh, that if that was the actual bell from the Dempsey Willard fight but it's a good story nonetheless and uh, um, that's still there um, I'd like to uh, one day get a historical marker put up somewhere in town that proved that that Dempsey lived here so um, I didn't do uh, all the research on on Jack Dempsey for for any reason for no for no reason I did it to write this book that came out in 2007 Dempsey in Nevada you can still get it at at Sundance bookstore and uh, um, and online and uh, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to do the little boy in this book is a guy named Buddy Garfinkel and uh, um, that uh, just passed away a couple of years ago and he had that frame hadn't or that picture hadn't been out of his frame in in 60 years when he let me use it so that was very exciting and that's it um thank you so much for uh allowing me to talk about jack dempsey one of my favorite subjects and uh um, i'll be happy to answer any questions well thank you guy that was amazing it was a really good program and and you know when we were talking beforehand it was like really it was back in 2007 that you'd worked and the book got published but um, this history is timeless and people are always fascinated about sportsmen and Dempsey and just his involvement within the state over the years. So he's he's pretty amazing. But let me read some questions I see from the chat. Okay. Um, the first question is, where and when was the fight photo shown early on with the immense crowd? Was this a Dempsey fight? Yeah, that was a Dempsey fight with the uh... Uh, George Carpentier, and that was held at a place called Boyle's 30 Acres in uh, New Jersey. Um, Tex Rickard wanted to have him um, in New York, but New York wasn't allowing prize fighting at the time, so the closest he could get was was New Jersey, so they had that fight there, and I think there were about 85,000 people. Um, his fight in, in Philadelphia against Gene Tunney in 1926 had 125,000 people at it, so he drew humongous crowds. That's amazing. Um, let's see, there, we have another question. I believe I read years ago that Jack Dempsey was also um, Native American. Uh, in your study, did you ever find out if this was true or not with his heritage? Um, I don't think so. I think that uh, um, I never saw any reference to, to Native American in there. There were some uh, his his family was a Mormon family. Um, they were he was born in Manassa, Colorado, and then they ended up in in Utah. And uh, um, he said that he had some Jewish blood as as well. But uh, I never saw any references to Native American that I could think of. Okay, um, we have another question. Uh, where would you rank Jack Dempsey in terms of all time Nevada boxers? Well, I mean, probably as good as any that that came through here. He wouldn't. Um, I guess we could claim him as a Nevada boxer since he since he lived in Reno for two years. So, um, with that as the criteria, then I list him as number one because how many heavyweights? Maybe maybe Mike Tyson would be would be the other to uh, to challenge him because Tyson lived in Vegas. So um, he'd be in my top two. Okay. Um, there is another question. Which street was the French Hotel and Elite Cafe businesses located in the background photo of Dempsey with the children? 
who's on Center Street East Side, just up from where Parker's would have uh, broken ground, taken over the uh, uh, cafe that was there. Okay. Um, well, there is a question for you, Guy. Uh, since you were born and raised in Gabs, do you ever witness the tarantula migration? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I had a pet tarantula for a while, and his name was Gabby, of course. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I think um, I didn't keep it for too long. We returned him to the desert. I didn't know they molted, but they they do that. But uh, yeah, if we okay. could every every fall um, about now from September, October, and stuff, you can go and uh, usually see see one out on the highway if you if you pay attention. Really. That's fascinating. Um, that that's all questions that the audience has asked. Um, well, when you were um, doing your book, um, was there anything in particular that you were surprised about when you were doing your research on Dempsey? Because um, I know, you know, just your own personal history and involvement, the rodeo. And so, you know, he has a lot of great ties and a variety of things. But I was just yeah. curious if there was anything Ab that just really stood out, Guy. Absolutely. There were so many surprises along the way. When I was first asked to consider doing this book, um, my friend Mick Laxalt, who's uh, Robert Laxalt, the writer's brother, and Paul Laxalt, the senator's brother, um, when he first asked me to do it, I didn't think there would be enough. Um, information out there to, uh, to, to be able to, to do it. And uh, I, I was never so wrong in my life from about 1918 on when he became the number one contender for the heavyweight title. You can almost track Dempsey daily, his life for the next 20 years through newspapers. There's that because he was always in the news and he was, he was, uh, media savvy and uh, you know his manager was Jack Kearns was at first and uh, and and then he was media savvy didn't always tell him the truth but but he 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 was out there all the time so there was always a story about Jack Dempsey so I found all kinds of um, just a wealth of uh, you know I had more challenges what not to include in the in there than than what I did include okay hey so when you um, showed uh, the image him with Clara Bow. How many do you know off the top of your head, or uh, how many photos, no photos, uh, movies he was involved in during his time with Hollywood? I was because I I hadn't realized he also was in movies at the time. I, I don't know exactly how many. I know there was one that called the Prize Fighter and the Lady that he and Max Bear were both in, and uh, um, I think he did a lot of shorts, but. Uh, um, I've seen some some people's collections of Dempsey, Dempsey photos, and there's pictures of him with the uh, um, oh Mickey Rooney and uh, Valentino and all just all kinds of people. It's uh, um, amazing. He was he was down there on the set all the time. He signed, um, I think, at one time he signed a, a million dollar contract for for a series of movies and and shorts. For, for one of the for one of the companies and I have one of his autobiographies that he uh, um, had signed to one of the the uh, movie movie people's head leaders I can't remember the guy's name now it's nobody I ever heard of and uh, so he was he was really involved in that for for several years so well, that, that's fascinating. I And then you had mentioned, too, about he was going to be doing vaudeville. Did he, was that yeah, kind the, of interchanged <laughs> or kind of during that time period as well? That happened always during that time period. The heavyweight champion would go perform, perform on vaudeville. That included, you know, going back to John L. Sullivan, who was one of the, probably the first uh, um, gloved champion back in the day and stuff like that. They would, they could make more money almost, uh, um, going on the road on vaudeville and recreating some of their fight scenes and stuff like that. Dempsey's big problem on vaudeville was that he didn't know how to to uh, um, to ease up on a punch. 
So he knocked out more than one uh, actor um, <laughs> recreating scenes um, from, from his fights. Wow, that's amazing. Neil, you, um, I saw you were, had your hand up. So well, I, I always like to, questions. I always like to thank our speakers. I was so excited when he just, uh, when I called him, so here we go. So away we go. But there's uh, stories that uh, he had told about Gab's not being a boring place and the troubles that he got into as a kid and so on. So it's just typical Nevada in through and through. He is just our guy. And I thank you from the bottom of my little old black heart. <laughs> thank you, Neil. <laughs> it was a great program. This is wonderful. Oh, um, the I, IMBD databases, he had 22 acting credits, 14 of them were shorts. Okay. And that's fascinating. So thank you. I appreciate that. Well, gosh, Guy, that was a great program. And and um, I so appreciated it. And and I really loved seeing the the pocket watch. So it, that was that was a pretty, pretty amazing piece. And the fact it's still around today. So yeah, I thought cool. so too. But, so I'd love to do a historical marker somewhere in town that recognizes that he was here, kind of along the lines of the Herald's Club one that was donated or dedicated a few years ago. So, absolutely, no, it, he really made an impact. And and um, you, one more question before I, I switch it back to the to the library. Um, you'd mentioned, and you know, we've seen the the fight. Um, the ring, you know, that Delongchamps designed and that in the next year there was another fight. Was it just a couple fights that were um, used for that? Yeah, there were just a handful of fights there and then it was torn down and just made the race track and eventually the rodeo arena as, okay. as the rodeo resumed. So that was okay. it. I, was I think I could never find it, but I think that uh, um, Dempsey might have... Uh, been in trouble with the Clover Valley Lumber Company of getting paid because I think that house that is on Joaquin Miller Avenue after Dempsey owned it, that um, the Clover Valley Lumber Company owned it. So I don't know if that was maybe part of the, the part of paying that off, but I never went to the, um, to the courthouse or the county or wherever to see if that was litigation or just how that all came about, so. That's interesting, that's very interesting. So, well, gosh, thank you, Guy. That was lovely. And we'll have to have okay. you at the Society for an in-person program here down the road. But thank you, everybody, for coming and watching the program today. Thank you, Guy and Neil. And of course, the Washoe County Libraries that really have helped us through COVID and even making these programs available for people during the week, but, you know, get to see these programs, um, perpetuity, you know, by being on websites and, and viewing at your leisure. So let me um, one more time say thank you and I'll turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you. I'm going to reiterate the thank yous. <laughs> thank you to our presenters, uh, Sherry Hayes-Zorn, Neil Cobb, Guy Clifton, and also to John, our Washoe County Library System Tech Wizard for making this event possible today. And thank you also for everyone who joined us. Thanks again, everybody.